I'm Tracy Worcester, and I've lived in the countryside most of my life. But whether it's in Britain or abroad, I've seen small family farms going bankrupt because of the arrival of giant factory farms. America's industrial pig farmers copied the chicken industry by cramming thousands of animals into a confined space. There are sometimes as many as 10,000 pigs in buildings like this, their waste dropping through a slatted floor. Throughout the 1990s, small farmers in America campaigned against the growth of big farms. Food has become a major profit-generating commodity and has spread onto a global playing field where food producers, workers, and consumers are reduced to pawns manipulated by giant corporations. During the 1990s, large-scale meat processors bought up livestock farms. This vertical integration allowed the corporations to control the whole process from farming and slaughtering to packaging. The factory farms were now the main buyers of pigs. And as the price paid for pigs fell, many small farmers went bust. The destruction of the small farm wasn't casual, it's systematic. It's, it is the intention, it's the way that they make money, it's the design of this industry. Once a company owns both the slaughterhouse and some of the farms, it destroys the capacity of the farmers to organize. I feel the responsibility to come here and warn Poland that they're gonna try to get away with something in Poland that people in the United States now recognize is a catastrophe. In North Carolina today, because of these facilities, you can drive across the state in rural areas and villages and see that the villages are now empty of people, that the hardware stores are closed, the feed stores are closed, the banks are closed, the churches and the schools are now closed, and the rural areas are empty. <laughs> The whole mission of the European Bank has been to industrialize Central and Eastern European agriculture. No question about that, and that has the effect of pushing out small farmers and independent farmers, and also the effect of opening it up to, to take over by foreign corporations. If the experts are worried about pollution and the exploitation of the Earth's resources, Shouldn't we be learning from Poland's traditional family farms and so protect them? It works, it's adequate for this number of hectares and for the number of people, and it doesn't use a lot of energy, and it doesn't therefore contribute to the greenhouse effect. And it, as oil becomes more and more expensive, uh, you're, you'll surely find that this kind of farming is going, going to be more attractive and more uh, economic for that matter. Polish agriculture at the moment is not productive enough. Small farms are too small uh, to be competitive. I think Poland wants and will have to be competitive on the world market and for that they will have to actually continue improving productivity. That will be over time, you know, at the expense of smaller farms. A lot of the European officials are saying that the Polish farmers are too small. They've only got 18 hectares. What's too small about that? They want to sweep them aside so uh, larger operators can take over and everything will be eventually owned by the corporations, I think. And what do you think will happen to Poland as a result of that? If Poland's family farmers are exterminated, as it were, it will destroy Poland's culture and, as far as that goes, its soul. The first state farm that Smithfield's Polish company Prima bought in 2001 was Boszkowo, which by 2004 housed 17,000 pigs. My guide, Marek Kreider, of the Polish Animal Welfare Institute, introduced me to one of the local residents. For many years before Smithfield arrived, they'd been complaining about their local groundwater, believing it to be contaminated. Could you tell me what specifically is the illnesses that people are getting around here? Z tego co ja wiem, to są to przede wszystkim ze strony przewodu pokarmowego, żołądek, poza tym jakieś zmiany na skórze. In June 2005, I was shown undercover film of what else was in this open cesspit they call a lagoon. Okay. This is 
fall in. Is there a bigger stick? Ale ja mam mamę, która właśnie miała, ma 84 lata i mama nie mogła oddychać, dusiła się, bo był taki smród, ten fetor i wtedy właśnie rozpoczęłam tą akcję. The local doctor Squara explained how neighbors and workers' lungs could be affected. To powoduje tworzenie się wydzieliny patologicznej pod wpływem drażniących gaz. Czyli zamiast mieć taki rur i taką rurą oddychać, schematycznie my oddychamy tak, już na ciężko zabrać, ciężko wypuścić. The risks that have been most studied are definitely the risk to people working inside the facility. And there is an extensive amount of science that really goes into some detail about how a pretty large percentage of the people working in these facilities, whether it's hogs or chickens, will come down with chronic sinus infections, asthma, uh, bronchitis, uh, and other respiratory diseases um, that are related to this mixture that they're breathing in. For stallholder Mike King, the secret of producing top quality pork lies in the humane treatment of his animals. I think pigs, are, they're such intelligent, sort of inquisitive animals. They need to be active all day long, searching for roots and grubs and things like that. Whereas pigs in concrete boxes, um, they've got nothing to do all day long, they're totally bored. The intensive system Mike referred to is how most of the pork imported into the UK is produced. In most EU countries, it's legal to keep pregnant sows permanently in stores like these, although they've been banned in the UK. I believe such cruelty happens when pigs are seen not as animals, but as an industrial raw material. Pigs in factory farms are usually raised on bare slats, but even on straw, they don't look healthy. In fact, many well-known brand names use pig meat from intensive factory farm systems from all over the EU. By not being specific on the label about where the meat comes from, it's possible to source from outside the UK and benefit from cheaper labour and lower animal welfare regulations. One of the big weaknesses of the system is their heavy dependence on antibiotics and the fact that that causes infections which can spread from animals to humans, such as Salmonella, E. coli, um, Campylobacter and even MRSA and in the Netherlands for example where the most research has been undertaken 40% of their pigs are carrying a strain of MRSA that can pass to humans. It's been spread rapidly on the pig farms because the antibiotics that are being put in the pig feed are actually selecting for it. That means they kill off the other bacteria which might provide some natural competition, but they don't kill off the MRSA because the MRSA is resistant. With the research we've already got, we could actually say, stop, enough's enough. We've got a system here which is actually causing the pigs to be carrying dangerous infections which, which are going to come home and haunt us. And meat which may appear very cheap is in fact very, very expensive. And in some cases that could be at the cost of our own lives. Qu'on stop la concentration et qu'on intègre à la fois le bien-être animal, la question de la santé, la question environnementale à l'intérieur des systèmes de production. Si cela est intégré dans le système de production, ce type d'atelier gigantesque industriel ne pourront pas continuer. Donc il faudra interdire de manière claire l'élevage industriel concentrationnaire à l'intérieur de l'Europe. The consumer ultimately has the power. They can say whether they buy cheap pork, that they don't care where it's produced or how it's produced or the quality of it. Ultimately, if the consumer refuses to buy that and prefers to buy meat which is a high welfare standard produced in an environmentally sensitive way, then we'll be on to a winner, you know. <laughs>